Okay, everybody, it's the Twisted History Podcast. Before I get started, uh, the Barstool Sports Store still has Twisted History uh, hoodies. St. Anne is wearing one right now, and T-shirts. It's the only two things that we push here, the only two things. So whenever you buy uh, one of those, uh, Jack Coleman gets free lunch or something like that. So if you go to the Barstool Sports Store, uh, you can get one of the hoodies or one of the T-shirts. They are widely, widely and wildly available. Um, Twisted History of Pilots is what we're doing today. It's myself and it's Vibs again. Yep. Um, a partner in crime at this point. Uh, my other partner in crime is Annie, except I have sex with her. I don't have sex with Vibs yet. Um, and then Jack Coleman on the uh, on the ones and twos. John is in Arizona, I believe, now, right? Uh, yeah. Right. He's, super, he's uh, big gaming. You know? He's at the big game. So this will be the week after the big game. Congratulations to whoever had won. Um, how are you, Vibsy? I'm beat it up right now for this episode, Large. Why? That's aviation slang for excited. Oh, or, really? Or worried. Okay. But I'm excited. I didn't get to a lot of stuff <laughs> that Annie had sent around because it's a huge, um, it's a huge subject. Like pilots, I thought I was going to have to reach, like find out where Stone Temple Pilots got their name or why they're called 21 Pilots. Like I was ready to do that type of stuff mm-hmm. or talk about the best TV pilots ever. Like kind of, you know, like when I do cutie, <laughs> yeah, cutie yeah. shit like yeah, that. I enjoy that. But it's not. It's all straight ahead pilots. I mean, you've got to figure that, you know, just from the nature of what they're doing. And you know the stat, one of the things you'd sent me. How much How much does a pilot make? About 175000 a year. Yeah. So on average, a pilot make, and that's um, that, it's a lot more than the average. Is that commercial? It, I think it's Delta. Delta. Oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. Nice. And so when I, well, I heard. That's they're they're the, the measuring stick. Right. Yeah, I agree. Um, but anyway, that's such a percentage above what the normal American makes. And that's good. Right. Like we all we, we talk about how a lot of times um, like the Kardashians had built a fortune off of Kim accommodating Ray J's giant cock. Right. You figured Two that's minutes. billions of dollars. Right. Like billions of dollars came from that. So you can argue maybe they're overpaid <clears throat> unless she was paid by the inch. And, you know, people sometimes think that, you know, um, teachers should make more than online influencers. And I kind of tend to agree. But the fact that pilots make a lot more than the average asshole, I think is probably the best <laughs> thing in the fucking world. That's good. Yeah, That's yeah. good. All right, so we're on the same page with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so we'll start kind of from the beginning. First, I'll, I'll do like something a little bit cheesy so people have something to talk about. A lot of people have been licensed pilots since the Wright brothers first took flight in 1903, so 120 years ago. That's how long we've been in the air. Um, in 2009, Tom Brady's then wife, Giselle Bunchen, are they officially divorced? I don't know. It's got to be They're, in the it's process. It's getting there. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, he's, he's taking pictures of himself naked on yeah. beds. She's got a train. Thirst trapping. Yeah. She's got a train. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but they both got their pilot license. I think she did when she was like nine months pregnant. She finally got her license uh, because they wanted to like get other options for taking private jets. So they got their helicopter license. And I think she also has her pilot uh, pilot license. Um, me doing the NASCAR stuff. And again, Vibsy's coming down to... Um, to Daytona, which will be next weekend when you're listening to this. It's amazing how many of the NASCAR drivers own their own jets and also fly their own jets. And the first time I went to Daytona, I think I've told this story before, I went to a concert. Daytona just, NASCAR in particular, just all of a sudden pops up random concerts. Mm-hmm. So when I was in L.A. last week, I spoke about it, it was Wiz Khalifa and it was Cypress Hill. When we're in Chicago, it's like, oh, I think uh, 21 Pilots or whatever. is, And then, like, Miranda mm-hmm. Lambert. Uh, I've seen, like, Morgan Whalen and all mm-hmm. these, like, different people uh, at concerts. Ice Cube, Pitbull, and every country western star who's popular, whose name I don't know. <clears throat> so my first race at Daytona, they had, I think it was Morgan Whalen, when he was just starting, too, it was a couple of years back. And he performed at the, uh, at the hangar. At the private hangar, so his stage was in front of all the uh, um, jets coming in, taxiing and coming in, and the the like the celebrities and the drivers were coming off. Mm-hmm. It's a very private jet driven um, sport because these guys for 38 straight weeks are going from Las Vegas to Coda down in Texas. So they'll take their jet, fly back to Charlotte, spend a couple of days with their family. Then they'll fly down to Texas and meet up with their haulers who had driven from Las Vegas to Coda. Mm-hmm. So um, it's, it, you know, anyway, circuits of the America is what Coda means. I should uh, uh, explain that. So a lot of guys that we speak to in NASCAR have their licenses and their own jets. Alexei Kovalev, licensed airplane pilot, owns his own plane. 
Um, Bob Barker. Let's make a deal. He's still alive, Bob Barker? Yep. Yeah. He's got to be, right? We'd know. Bob Barker? Yeah. Yeah. I thought he passed away. No, no, no. He's still he's still here. Have you pet spayed or neutered? He's got to be alive still, right? When when Bob Barker dies, I will... It'll reverberate through the Vibs household? Uh, yes. Right. Will oh, it? my God. I feel bad. I had the guy dead. How old is oh, he? Oh, my God. What's the over-under that, that he lasts longer than a week after? Oh, my God. We just, <laughs> oh, we just doomed no. Barker. We just doomed Barker. Oh, oh God. No. Don't Not buy any good. green he's, bananas. He's, he's good. But he is 99. Oh, he's God, he's Jesus ancient, Christ, yeah. We killed Bob, Bob Barker. Barker is 99? Yeah. Oof. Um, he just turned 99. No, he'll be 90. He'll be 100. Uh, no, he, turned he just turned 99, 99 a month ago. All right, this is partially oh, twisted God. history of Bob Barker. He was trained as a Navy fighter pilot in World War II. But he wasn't sent to a oh, fleet no. squadron in time to fight. So when he finally got sent over to get behind the yoke of a fighter jet, the, uh, the, the Z Germans had already given up. So he was once quoted as saying, I was all ready to go, and when the enemy heard that I was headed for the Pacific, they surrendered. That was at the end of World War II. It's a classic Bob Barker quote. Please, somebody earmark that for, unfortunately, when Bob Barker had died earlier this afternoon. Like, Write when we have to do that now. thing. Yeah, yeah, I got to get that <laughs> blog up. Uh, Jimmy Buffett owns six planes. He flies himself to and from Margaritaville, wherever the fuck he goes. John Travolta, I think probably one of the more popular celebrity pilots yeah right yeah yeah, yeah. he has and his the, own airport he, yeah he has like a 757 or like a, a commercial airline <laughs> right po- uh, plane he probably shouldn't and whatever i mean i don't like to judge i wasn't put on this world to be a goalie well, he is a They're scientology probably. guy right yeah big mm. big time yeah <laughs> he got his pilot license at 22 so he was young that was like saturday night fever john travolta too you know he has his own personal airport at home and he owns um five uh airplanes morgan freeman Freckles, right? Is that Freckles? Yep. Yeah, he didn't learn to fly until he was 65. I'm not agreeing with that either. I don't never, think he should. Never too late. No, it is. Like, yeah. <laughs> because I always bring up, and then former Yankee Corey Lytle. Remember him? Mm-hmm. He was also one, and he, he had his uh, co-pilot in 2006 when he crashed into a New York apartment building. Both men died in the accident, and 26 firemen were injured trying to put out the fire. Lytle was the third Yankee slash pilot who was killed that I could find. Um, the most famous was definitely Thurman Munson when I was a kid. That happened in 1979. I was eight. Thurman Munson was a catcher for the Yankees. He's my uh, all-time, one of my all-time favorites and one of the few Yankees jerseys I, like, consistently wear. Thurman yeah. Munson. Yeah, Munson is a good one to root for. Yeah. Like, he was, he had, you know, yeah. Greg Nettles. Like, people used to kind of dig Willie Randolph and all that. You know, growing up, there was all these, like, iconic Yankees, obviously. But Munson was definitely one of them. So when he died, it dealt a blow. By the way, terrible death. Munson crashed the plane. I think there were two other people on board. Those two people uh, survived, but Munson uh, had his skull fractured on the way down, and he was still strapped into his seat. So these other two guys, I didn't write this in the script. I apologize. I'm going to strip, you know, trying to get him out. Uh, but he was essentially paralyzed. He couldn't, but he was aware of what was going on around him. And finally, as the flames started to engulf the cabin, they had to leave him there. So he died of asphyxiation of uh, toxic chemicals and then was burned to death. Wow. Yeah, Thurman Munson didn't have a, a he did not have a nice last uh, last dance. No. Yeah. Oof. It's metal. Yeah. Bob Barker and a dead Thurman Munson. We're starting off on highs. <laughs> yeah. Here. I apologize. You know, you know, Bill Burr has a helicopter pilot license. Get out of here, really? Yeah. I oh, heard him do a joke about it. That's he? all I'm at <laughs> no, I'm to this episode. The old yeah. propeller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The third, uh, yeah. uh, the third Yankee, uh, the third Yankee pilot who had died was a guy named Jim Harden, who died in 1991. Not really familiar with that story, but he was a pitcher. His name was Jim Harden. I'm not familiar with his story as a Yankee. I don't know how good or bad he was. I'm very familiar with the story of his death during his uh, plane's descent. Right, his plane was going down. He had seen a baseball field. Filled with young children. Yeah. The fucking New York Yankee. I'll land it there. So he steered away from it. Oh, he knew good he was, for him. He was going to crash land into a baseball field filled with young children. And like as Annie and I were talking about this, particularly in the car right in, these flight recorders have everything. Mm-hmm. So to me, that's iconic status. And you know where he steered into instead? A TGI Fridays. Landed in the parking lot. TGI Fridays was under construction. No. Oh, okay. Thank God, I yeah. guess. But if you had to choose, if you're a pitcher for the New York Yankees, think about that, guys. 
and you're going down, and all of a sudden it's like baseball field full of kids, and possibly a TGA Fridays where a lot of people are drinking three dollar margaritas and mm-hmm. kill them. Like they've made a bad choice. These kids still have their innocence. Those kids right? can run; they're yeah. fast. <laughs> yeah. So my dad used to say TGI Fridays. That was the place to be back in the day. Really? Oh, hell what are yeah. you? T- yeah, we'd meet. Fire we were off. just talking about this too the <laughs> yeah. other day. Yeah. Like yeah, between be TJ Fridays and Applebee's versus Bennigan's and Hulahan's. <laughs> oh, Hulahan's chicken fingers, top I've notch. Been on I'm gonna right. shout them out every single time. I don't know if I've they ever bang. had them. Yeah, I just oh, got there all time. I got diarrhea talking. I've been about on it. a date to Hulahan's. Did you? Oh yeah, <laughs> back yeah. In, back in the day. Those second tier ones. <laughs> That's why Dibs is a big fan of that part of mine. Yeah. Hey baby, you like Hulahan's? Suspenders and flair. Yeah. Oh, maybe we're thinking of different places. Suspenders was the Bennigan. Chili's is one step up, would you say? Yeah. I don't know. And no. the pantheon no. of that shit is Chili's. Chili's, yeah, Chili's up know. there. I'm putting Applebee's <laughs> way up talking, there. If you start talking step up. No, I, I really, I Applebee's. don't know. Believe me, I, I, I know we're swimming in a fucking parking lot filled with whale vomit, but <laughs> is Chili's the top of that food chain? And then where do you go? Applebee's, I would have thought Hands, TGI Fridays Hulahan's is probably up there. I think Hulahan's really? is the top top one. I didn't even go like I Red Robin or, is. you know, any of those things. I, I don't know. Because mm. I don't know if Hulahan's is necessarily a family place, right? Isn't that more for Red like, Robin would fit more in with like a smash burger. Right. High end burger. Yeah. Fast casual. Fast casual. Chili's might take it there. Or Hulahan's. So many, I mean, somebody had said, I, I, like I go to Chili's. I took Finn the other day because he goes uh, traditionally with my parents. And it's the same chips and salsa. They throw salsa, salsa, whatever they put on the table. And um, it's, you know, this yeah. is what it is. Can I, I think Hands is might be the top. They did a rebranding. They're way up there. Hands is up there. Hands is up there. Yeah. I, the Hands isn't what it used to be. It's, it's they Uh-oh. modernized. Kind of like Wendy's, how they all went and put, like, fireplaces in them. Right. Are TGI yep. Fridays still around? Yeah, there's a couple. Oh, you can find them. I think so. Okay. I hope you, so. You well, I mean, there's one in like house. Penn Station. You go to the Is Indianapolis there? Fashion oh. Mall on a on a Friday. You can find me there, yeah. <laughs> sitting at the bar. <laughs> yeah. By the way, you're you're now ten minutes into a podcast, and you've learned that you know how Thurman Munson died, the decisions that uh, that this guy uh, Jim Harden had made. Who the pantheon of fucking fast casual is, right? Mm-hmm. You, you you don't walk around. You don't walk out of here uh, unknowledgeable. I think. I, I think this is the most important podcast everybody. on the internet. Um, let's go back to the first plane. So all the way back to the first plane. In 1903, that engine that the Wright brothers had designed generated a whopping 12 horsepower. 12 horsepower for people who don't know would be like strapping two handheld lawnmowers on either side of a glider. That's essentially what they did. The average car now has anywhere from 180 to 200 horsepower. I know some people are like, well, mine's 250, whatever. Uh, <laughs> according to Car and Driver, the car with the highest horsepower in the world is the Hennessy Venom F5. I went to go see what the newest one is and because the Hennessy Venom F5 is no longer that car, but the one they put up has technically never reached its threshold, so they can't measure it. So I went with the Hennessy, fuck it. Uh, So the Hennessy Venom F5 has 1,600 horsepowers. Horsepowers? Horsepower. 1,600. It was designed to travel at speeds up to 301 miles per hour. It can reach 186 in under 10 seconds. And has a base price of 1.6 million. And has 1,600 horsepower. The first plane had 12, right? And it was a fucking death trap. It was 100% a death trap. I, and I know that we did a Twisted History of Flight. I'm going to refer to it a couple of times. But the Wright brothers are traditionally known as what? Innovators and inventors? I mean, that's what everyone knows that they are. But mm-hmm. they were fucking daredevils. 100% daredevils. They have no business doing what they did. Um, and the fact, the proof is in the pudding because Orville Wright, uh, was involved in what's considered the first fatal aviation accident. So they did the Kitty Hawk thing in 1903. And then in 1908, once they started manufacturing these gliders slash planes, um, Orville had taken up a uh, in a two-passenger Wright military flyer. They were doing a demonstration for the Army at Fort Myer, Virginia. And he took up Army Signal Corps Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge as a passenger. And a few minutes into the flight, the propeller suddenly disintegrated. 
that's not that's good. A, yeah, I, I looked it up like a couple of times if I can get a better account of what had happened. And it seems like that's it. Like I think a balsa would disintegrate. I think of glass. Mm. <laughs> like you know what I mean? Yeah. Like so the so it disintegrated. And the aircraft spiraled out of control, as they tend to do, and it smashed into the ground at full speed. So rescuers pulled an unconscious Selfridge, Selfridge from the wreckage. Selfridge from the wreckage is tough to say. And the lieutenant died just a couple of hours later. Orville was hospitalized for six weeks after suffering a broken leg, four broken ribs, and a back injury that impaired him for the rest of his life. Okay? So now this timeline is forming. And I, we've probably discussed this before. But you go to a makeshift airplane in 1903, right? And then in 1908, propellers were apparently still disintegrating with the Wright brothers. These, these are big names in the industry. But by 1914, just 11 years after Kitty Hawk, they had a passenger plane. Passenger service had started. It was small. It was January, and it went from St. Petersburg to Tampa. It was called the St. Petersburg-Tampa Airboat Line. And it was a service between, like, over the Tampa Bay in Florida, from St. Pete's to Tampa. This 11 years after they went up in a fucking, it looks like those old, like, kits that you put together, you know, like it was like mm-hmm. little styrofoam it's things. Made it like, yeah, yeah. Like that to me, I don't, I don't, like, people talk about innovation and cell phones and AI and all this kind of stuff that's really moving quickly, but. 11 years, they go from, you know, crashing into a beach and disintegrating to taking people over Tampa Bay. Blows yeah. my mind. Having it open to the public. Where yes. You, yeah, good yeah, luck. You can pay your way to get on that, mm-hmm. on that fucking death trap. By the way, do you know where, oh, so, oh, Ohio boys, right? I think they're Dayton boys. Do you know where they both went to college? Orville and Wilbur? Miami of Ohio. Mm. High school dropouts, both of them. High school dropouts made the first fucking plane, wow. and then we all got on it. Anyway. Um, I'll get away from the history of flight because we just did an episode on in June of 2021. Sorry. So the uh, so we're, we're talking about. Andy how raised much... her hand. Andy you. Yeah. yeah, hot redhead front row. Yeah. yeah, who's been making eyes at me for the past quarter of a century. So we're saying that a Delta Airlines pilot average is about averages about 175 thousand, right? Which right. is above the national average. The average national average is like Great. 110, which mm. is which is still very good. Do you know how much a Venom Hennessy car costs made in Texas? Most of them are made in Texas, some in England. But do you know how much they how many how much a Hennessy Venom costs? One point six million. One point three. Three million. Oh, wow. Three million now, huh? <laughs> Could you? Imagine? I mean, right. a pilot's not buying one anytime soon. Yeah. Stick with flying, right? Yeah. Want that horsepower. Right. So, I mean, when I did the thing, like I said, it's an outdated stat. I just didn't want to go into the new one, but three million dollars. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, oh, and we're not in an inflation. Period? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Oh, oh, what's sorry. going on? <laughs> um, also, so, shout out Kitty Hawk. Uh, I've been there a couple of times. Have I've, you? Yeah. The the sand dunes and everything out North there Carolina. are crazy. Yeah. Um, my whole family, we would like North roll Carolina, right? Am I crazy? Outer Banks, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. You, we would like roll down the hills and everything. It felt like you were in like Star Wars. It's crazy. Really? Out there. Yeah, my dad loves it. I bet. Yeah, I'd like to do that too. That's, uh, you know, I don't know where the marketing or the merchandise uh, possibilities are here since they won't let me sell Zippo lighters or switchblades. The only thing I've ever asked for. And inappropriate shirts. Mm. Like inappropriate shirts, you know? Um, so Shocker. maybe it's going to be the uh, the tours. Maybe the in two weeks tours. we'll have to put a farewell Bob Barker. We'll take 10,000 people <laughs> to Normandy. The Normandy Kitty Hawk uh, fucking yeah. world Yeah, you got tour. Kitty Hawk kites right across the street. Really? It's like a big-ass uh, just store with like toys and everything. It's awesome. North, yeah. North yeah. Carolina, South Carolina, their stock it just keeps going through the roof. Yeah. I've only heard good oh, yeah. things right. about them. No, yeah. Outer Banks are top tier. Nothing like the show. Can't pronounce their, their the name of, what is it, Rally? Raleigh? Raleigh. Raleigh. Yeah, yeah. Please don't, don't, yeah. don't have them come Rally? for me. Yeah, yeah. That's what it is. <laughs> we'll settle on that. Uh, before I move on from those guys, I'm going to do another daredevil from uh, from a, the state of Ohio. Neil Armstrong was born in Ohio. And um, so Neil Armstrong, for people who don't know, was the first man to step foot on the moon in 1969. It's another wild thing. <laughs> you know, 1903 and 66 years later on the fucking moon, allegedly. You know where he went to school? He went to school in, please tell me where. Yes, yeah, I want you to guess. Oh, yeah. uh, so Neil Armstrong went to school at uh, Indiana. No, the their rival Purdue University. Is he a Purdue guy? Yeah, they have like they have like eight Boiler astronauts. Makers. I'll Boiler say up. that. I, I don't say anything. I will never say anything good about Purdue, but they've got some smart people that go there. Okay, Boiler up. I'm surprised you went to Purdue. Nice uh, naval aviator. So he gets to be mentioned here. 
obviously U.S. astronaut. I think we can consider most astronauts pilots, right? Um, but inside his spacesuit, I think people may or may not know this, was a piece of fabric from the left wing of the original 1903 Wright Flyer and a piece of wood from the airplane's left propeller, which probably disintegrated at some point. But, um, yeah, so I think that's kind of cool that Neil Armstrong, if you're going to carry a keepsake on your way to the moon, it's probably a good one. Um, but I'm going to start off this, not start off because I'm already into this fucking thing. I'm going to start off with some of the worst pilots. A guy had sent me this uh, story. <clears throat> it reminded me, listen, I have some great pilot stories for you guys today. Honestly, I have some great pilot stories. This one you may not consider great, but it reminds me a lot of the Killdozer. Right, which we, mm. yeah. The documentary Tank or whatever it yeah. was, Tank, the, I think. Yeah. The Tank guy, who knew he wasn't making it out alive, right? And and um, nobody was killed. He did a tremendous amount of damage and whatnot, but it kind of reminds me of that story. Uh, somebody had sent it in to me. Um, Kansas City Superiority was the name of the handle that sent it in to me. And it's about Richard Russell, the Sky King of Alaska. You ready, Sky King? Make I'm it happen, Captain. That's, That's a soul. sweet name. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 29-year-old guy is a ground service agent. Um ground service agent somebody said he was a bag a baggage handler which i think he was at one time but he was also in charge of those um those vehicles that kind of tow the planes around so they're facing the right way you know what i mean mm -hmm. like one of those type of dudes maybe he did a little bit of this if you're not watching on the youtube i'm making those um whatever i'm doing uh <laughs> so air traffic yeah guy kind yeah. Of than what you did last week yeah oh yeah i did something about uh, blowing something oh yeah yeah oh yeah yeah so this 20, <laughs> yeah yeah so this 29 year old guy he hijacked an empty which is important to know 76 seat q400 aircraft belonging to alaska airlines regional carrier horizon i love alaska airlines um Planes. They all have just the Inuit guy on the tail. It's you love that. Awesome. You I shout love, it out every time you see it. I love it. that guy. I love him. I can't call him Eskimo anymore, uh, but I did. Um, all right. So this guy, 29 years old, he had witnessed so many takeoffs and landings working there, and he was like, I think I can do it. He managed <laughs> several barrel rolls and loop-de-loops before he crashed a plane into a small island in the Puget Sound, 25 miles, miles south of SeaTac, Seattle, Tacoma. All right. So he was basically a, bag, a baggage handler, and he stole a $40 million airplane and went on a suicidal joyride. That's the Sky King of Alaska. For more than an hour, he did aerobatics and low passes just south of the airport while being followed by a pair of National Guard F-15s. Those jets were both armed with Sidewinder missiles, AIM-120 AMRAAM air-to-air missiles, and they went supersonic, generating sonic booms on the way to Puget Sound. When they called the cops on him in the form of two uh, jet fighters, they went, I love the fact they went supersonic to go get his ass. Yeah. But they weren't going to shoot him down because he was over land for the most part. So they're trying to guide him out um, into the sea, uh, uh, specifically the Puget Sound. Alrighty. So here he is kind of, um, oh, and on top of the two jets, they also sent out a strato tanker. Like they sent out this support tanker where the jets could land on and refuel depending on how long this fucking guy stayed in the air. They were ready. They were yeah. ready for a standoff. It's crazy, right? So you got you got F-15s behind you. You got a, a super tanker in the water, and you're just doing it. So um, the whole time, this guy remained in contact with air traffic control. If I say ATC, just know that's air traffic control. I got sick of Look riding at you. it. Thanks. And at one point, he said to air traffic control, "I'm a broken guy." that got a few screws loose. When ATC suggested that he uh, land at a nearby army base, Russell refused, saying, those guys will rough me up if I try to land there. I don't know what accent that is. Yeah. I think I might mess something up there, too. I wouldn't want to do that. I'm, I'm, see, what accent am I I doing? don't know. I'm kind of imagining like a, a Robert De Niro, yeah. a role for Robert De Niro, or like a young Dustin Hoffman. Yeah, I'm a broken guy. Yeah, you know? I'm a broken Maybe Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm broken. I got screws loose. <laughs> he asked the people at air traffic control, could he get a job as a pilot with Alaska Airlines if he successfully landed the aircraft? And they said back to him, we'd give you a job doing anything if you could pull this off. Just trying to get the guy to land it. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, right. Nah, I'm a white guy. Oh, so a little bit. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> he spoke with wanting to do a couple of maneuvers, see what the aircraft could do. You know, kick the fucking carbon off the engine. And he requested the coordinates of a killer whale, an orca, that had been brought to national attention saying, I want to go see that guy. <laughs> 
Again, I, I think it's cute. You said knock the carbon off the engine. Oh, thank you. Is that is that a real thing? Keep going. <clears throat> okay. He stated that he didn't want to hurt anyone, and in the final minutes of the communication, apologized to his friends and family. Near the end of the flight, the aircraft was seen performing a barrel roll over Puget Sound, recovering 10 feet over the water. When an air traffic controller requested he land the plane, after that maneuver, he said, I don't know. I don't want to. I was, cop- I was hoping that that was going to be it, you know, meaning that he thought that would be the thing that killed him. And then he added, I really wasn't planning on landing it. That's where it gets like that killdozer feel, mm-hmm. you know, and he didn't land it. The two F-15s attempted to direct him towards the Pacific Ocean, but they never fired at him. And Russell ultimately crashed on Keytron Island in Puget Sound, killing himself upon impact and destroying the aircraft. The resulting fire burned a two-acre area, but was extinguished the following morning. Uh, Keytron Island, no one's ever heard of it, <clears throat> although I'm probably going to get a DM. Hey, Large, I'm from Keytron Island. I remember this thing almost hit my mom. It's pronounced Katron. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's pronounced Katron. You fucking loaf. Yeah, yeah. So, no injuries were reported to the few residents of the sparsely populated island, despite the crash being in close proximity to at least one cabin, which was occupied. This was in 2018. So, federal agencies led the investigation, right? This is after 9 11, is the point that I'm making to make sure to describe the perpetrator, 29-year-old Richard Russell, as suicidal and said his actions did not constitute a terrorist incident and that Russell was found to have acted alone. Because I'm sure when this thing happened in wake of 9-11, even though it's 2018, it's what we first go to. So I find it interesting that when I talk about crashes that happened before 9-11, people are like, oh, it's just a crazy son of a bitch. Here you got to kind of get into that. The final descent at Keytron Island was determined to be intentional, and suicide was listed as the manner of death. This is the only addendum I'm going to put in here, Vibs. <clears throat> a couple of years later, Rolling Stone magazine investigated the incident and reported in 2021 that some of Russell's friends and family believe he may have suffered brain injuries during his football years in high school and college. A football teammate suggested his mental instability had been caused by undiagnosed chron- chronic traumatic encephalopathy 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 oh encephalopathy that may have come from repeated concussions so Damn. yeah Damn. that's a little bit different right a little Damn. bit sobering but still the guy was crazy as shit house right go ahead can i ask you this say say this is it's not a suicide attempt it's just a guy going out for a joyride right. lands it say it's your kid are you mad at them when they get home like how pissed are you when they get home and like you just stole an f-350 or like a, a commercial And he plane. lands it. And he, yeah, he lands it. He gets home. Like, what were you thinking? What this were you doing? This is a 76 passenger uh, plane. Yep. So it's not huge, but right. it's big enough that you took it from Cleveland to Dayton, you know, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like Cleveland, uh, Dayton to South Bend. Um, first of all, the kid's not coming home, right? He's going to jail for a while. <laughs> yeah, right? true. Yeah, yeah. You know, but when I do, do I, I don't know. I, I can't see myself as saying, I'm proud of you, young man. But I'm a little... Like, I just got a, a letter from Alabama, mm-hmm. uh, alcohol incident. Oh, uh, let's go. Yeah, yeah. They're the best. And then oh, you know, they're the Mick best. told me, we, we knew about it. I'd you like know. to know why it didn't come to me, too. Yeah, we knew <laughs> about it. Mm-hmm. And so first, He must have known for a while, too. No, was, he told I us. I did. First, he told me. Yeah. I, sure, can I talk about it on there? No. Why not? Oh, so first week there, yeah. somebody had ran their head through one of his doors, like, you know, in the in the dorm room. Mm-hmm. He's, he's got like three or four roommates. I'm not mentioning names. And they fixed somebody... it right away. Like yeah. they fixed it right away. Like, yeah. nice. you know, and so I then, think the kid's dad got him in trouble. I think when well, no, I think the kid got in trouble by his dad. I think his dad so out. when That's I awesome. guess they put a similar incident because kids tend to headbutt through doors all the time. Him and his uh, roommates got tagged so much so that the RA then inspected that they did break a door. Which he reported, and then now he's got to do like a half hour class oh, on yeah. alcohol awareness. I think he's got to write a paper and all that stuff. I don't believe there was a fine, and um, so that's pretty benign. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, so I had that conversation. I think he had with to my pay kid. seven dollars. Yeah. I wonder what I would say to my kid after he stole a fucking airplane sober, right? And landed it, you know, at SeaTac. Because, like, like you said, it's not really a, a. He's not a monster, right? He's just a kid who stole a plane. So many people were in danger. When he's doing barrel rolls True. over that fucking same baseball field but he mm-hmm. nailed that Jim decided to not go at. So many. I don't know. I used to take the car so many all TGI the time when Fridays I was Fridays are underneath alive. them. Like, yeah. I used to car take is the different car than a 76 time. passenger It is, airplane. but. No, it is. I It, it is different, <laughs> yeah. but I didn't know how to drive. I was teaching myself how to drive at 10, whereas this kid, 
obviously knew what he was doing. He had I don't I don't discount your ability to drive. You're a better driver than me. Um, but you can't learn how to fly a plane on the fly. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, but I he obviously knew what he was doing. He probably watched yeah. a lot of um, virtual, like Za. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes they say you can really yeah become a professional do- learning virtually. So maybe he did, and I don't know. I will tell you that when I read this story, and I never heard of the Sky King of whatever. I never Sky heard King of him. Alaska? Yeah, Sky King of Alaska. I never heard of him until uh, a Kansas City Superiority sent it to me. But I do remember a similar incident in 1999. I remember it. Because Air Botswana was crippled. The whole uh, company, Air Botswana, mm-hmm. was crippled. And I, I say that kind of, you shouldn't know how big or small a company that is unless you have a very specific travel needs, okay? So it was crippled when one of its pilots crashed an empty aircraft in, uh, in a Botswana airport, destroying the aircraft and two more Air Botswana planes. I'll tell you about it. The guy's name is Chris Fotsway. He stole the plane, and then for two hours, he just circled around the airport. That's creepy. Radioing the control tower, announcing his intention to kill himself. Like, so now think about that. You're in an airplane. You're in an airport, not even an airplane. And you're sitting there waiting for your flight. Like, listen, I don't know what's going to happen, but there is some guy up there saying he's going to kill himself, circling. So they had to fucking evacuate the whole thing, right? And evacuating again, an Air Botswana hangar probably required one bus. But still, (laughs) they had to get everybody the fuck out of Dodge. Okay? So, um, the airport was evacuated, and then he crashed the plane at a speed of about 200 miles per hour into the airline's only two other working planes, which were parked on the apron, destroying all three aircraft. That's just unlucky for Air Botswana. They only have three planes. One of them gets stolen. And he crashes into the other two parked fucking planes, right? At the time, he was uh, on medical leave from the airline, having failed a physical two months previously and been declared unfit to fly. So now with no working aircraft, the government had to step in and privatize the airline. I remember this. I do remember this because I'd looked it up. And I can tell you now that 24 years later, I proudly tell you that Air Botswana went from having only three working planes in its fleet to currently having four working planes yeah. in its fleet and uh, servicing a total of eight different destinations on the continent leave, of Africa. Leave the world better than you found it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Air Botswana said, fuck you, and came back uh, better than ever. Good for them. Yeah. Um, here's one, and it's it's a little bit of a backstory before we get to it, but what's the uh, what's the where were you moment of your lifetime? This, uh, this is a loaded question. I probably should have said, Vibsy, I'm going to ask you where's the where were you moment of your lifetime. Mm-hmm. I should have asked you all that beforehand. So if you don't have it, I get it. But I know mine. So what's the where were you? Does anyone have one? Probably September 11th. Yeah, September yeah, 11th. The is, it jumps out. Is, yeah. was, I mean, you, understandably, outside of September 11th, was there a where were you thing? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Okay. Where were you? Uh, what, what was? Do, do you want me to say it? Because I... It was, was definitely, it, uh, it was definitely this story. Oh, okay. Yeah. What, what about Hands you? Hands down. Kobe. The one com- Kobe dying in the motorcycle. Yeah. Or the helicopter. The helicopter. Yeah. 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 helicopter. Yeah, the motorcycle. Uh, it's a kind of a motorcycle, but different. Yeah. Um, Kobe <laughs> and his daughter, yeah. I remember where I was with that. Yep. Mm-hmm. I remember, that obviously, very, with September That was a 11. wild day. Mm-hmm. I Actually, remember I w- storming the Capitol, too. I think mean, January oh, really? 6th, yeah. I weirdly was tuned into the news we, that day. We were here it's with so- the TVs on. Yeah. Were yeah. yeah, yeah. I know a lot of people, like normal jobs, didn't even really know what was going on unless they were on Twitter, but we had the TVs turned on here and we're just checking oh, it out. It was wild. I was all alone off campus. I, I like, remember Let's check the news when <laughs> Steve Harvey announced the wrong person. Oh, that mm-hmm. was yeah. yeah. I remember that night. We were watching. Was ironing it. Yeah. a shirt. <laughs> I had a fucking and I, I don't remember shit. You were packing to go to San Fran. Yeah. I could, uh, every Super Bowl, I could tell you where I was for really? that. Really? Just yeah. 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 I remember yeah. when um I, th- I think it, when that girl. Baby Jessica, I mean, you guys are way too young to remember her. She fell down a well? She fell down a well, but she fell down the well, like, in a split. Yeah, poor girl. Like, she was, I don't know, she's like 18 months. She's porn now, right? Two months, what? She did porn now? No, oh, somebody Jesus. else. Baby Jessica? Yeah. Baby let's, Jessica? Let's I don't think so. It's with an I eye don't, now instead of I don't, an eye. I don't think so, but hey, I believe well. when she <laughs> fell down the well, she fell down like a, it was like a pipe that was like this big, and she fell down, like, she fell down in like a split, like dislocated, and I remember that we were coming back. I think this was the same day. I'll have to look up the date. Mm-hmm. But we were coming back from the down the shore that weekend, and for some reason there was like there was like a twenty five car pile up on the parkway. As mm-hmm. Jack will know, it'll shut down everywhere. Like, oh yeah. yeah. And uh, 
you couldn't go anywhere. And we were all just like flipping through the news. There was like thousands of cars. Right. And that was the only thing. Like people were like glued Boston to the radio. Boston bombing too is another one that just came. Oh out yeah, the marathon? I remember yeah. that yeah. marathon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you can see I, that. Yeah. I remember um, reading fights as blogs so for that. Yeah. yeah. Was, uh, so I think I think like everyone kind of whatever right. it does does connect on a okay. Yeah, uh, baby Jessica lives in Midland, Texas. She has a loving husband who is a foreman at a pipe supply company and she is a special education teacher's aide at an elementary school. She is Apologies. not do Apologies porn. to the uh, baby <laughs> Jessica. Somebody who got caught in a well wound up doing porn, I can guarantee it. It definitely wasn't baby Jessica. I apologize. But the reason that I'm saying is that outside of 9-11, for me, um, it's the OJ case. And mm-hmm. I think that OJ case has gotten so far back, because 1994, right, that it was before Jack was born. You know what I mean? Like, you know, for example, you know, Vibs was in diapers. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the first things I remember being on the nightly news and my mom watching and, like, it being right. but every for, night. But for me, it was very, um, I don't know, it's, I have a loose, and I'd never watched any of the OJ uh, documentaries, never watched anything for it afterwards because I felt like, like, I forgot about Chernobyl. Until I watched mm-hmm. Chernobyl, and I'm glad I did. Mm. Wasn't I've, there a basketball game that it interrupted when OJ I'm get came to on? It. Yeah, one one hundred percent. You're one hundred percent right. But I remember it as being some. So I haven't done anything. So I'm going to revisit it for you guys just for a second. Mm-hmm. Just for a second. I won't go through the whole thing. I, I promise. Because we could do an episode on that. Um, should. Oh, we but, should do it. That'd be a great. Yeah. I, I just remember yeah, I don't buying know much a about solo it. cup. I haven't watched any documentaries on it either. A lot of people just know him as the guy who tweets and may have, may have killed his wife. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? They I know still him do Cuba that Gooding now. Jr. Like when you yeah, go Cuba to Gooding a friend, like when there's a game on, do people still sell cups? Like I remember, like one of the things that the reason why I remember that night was because everybody had a. It was five bucks for a solo cup, and like you had mm. a because it was a big game. That's mm-hmm. and so when that broke in, everybody was like, you know, what if we run out of beer? Right, right, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to recap it real quick. On the night of June 12, 1994, Nicole Brown Simpson, who was ex-wife of O.J. They weren't married at the time. People forget that. But the mother of his two children um, and her friend, uh, Ron Goldman, were found stabbed to death outside of Nicole's condo in Brentwood uh, in Los Angeles. Okay? I think they had been divorced maybe two years only. I, I, see, I already learned. I thought it was just uh, his wife. No, no. I didn't know there was another guy. Yeah, handsome guy, Ron Goldman. Yeah. Wow. I had someone once tell me that they were, even though they were divorced, they were still kind of a couple, mm-hmm. and that like a week before. Don't, don't go. I'm dip, not giving don't names. Don't go too deep into fucking OJ then, because I will do a whole episode. No, no, you I'm just saying it has nothing to do with that. But he was saying that the week before, when he was in that same restaurant, OJ came in looking for her like he was a total psychopath. He's yeah, he like, was. He was yeah. a total psychopath. But I mean, he came in the restaurant looking for her. Right. And he was like, you know, starting stuff like just in a, a week before. In a frenzy, for yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. Whoever slashed her throat in particular was so strong that he or she, can't, I can't just assume it was he that slashed her throat, almost cut her head off. So the machete got lodged in, uh, in her spine. So O.J. Simpson... Her ex-husband, <laughs> Vibs is going to be sick. Who pleaded no contest to domestic violence charge against Brown in 1989, so he, he did have a history there, was an immediate person of interest in their murders, since he was incredibly strong and he had this history of beating her up. Okay, so after the police had gathered all the evidence, charges were filed and a warrant was issued for Simpson's arrest. Okay, this is how the chase started. Oh, and everyone kind of knows the chase, right? It was a slow. Slow chase. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a high-speed chase. It was a slow-speed chase. OJ, in agreement with his attorneys, was scheduled to turn himself in at 11 a.m. on the morning of June 17th, five days after the murders. He says, I will turn myself in for this investigation. Okay? But he failed to do that. The 11 a.m. thing to go to the Parker Center Police Department had came and went. And he later became the subject of a low-speed pursuit by police while riding in, and everyone knows what he was riding in, right? Mm -hmm. A white Bronco. A white Bronco, Okay, a 1993 Ford Bronco SUV. So I have a photograph of this. Vibs has a lot of historical photographs. I found another great one for Vibs uh, this week. I might buy from him. Um, But it's a full-blown photograph the size of this, and it's the Bronco. And A.C. Cowlings is riding it, and and it says, Peace to O.J. A.C. Cowlings. I bought it for 600 bucks. For some fucking reason. There's a picture of AC signing it on the back. I don't remember where we got it. I have no idea. I had uh, extra money at the time. Oh, no, I got it in uh, Red Bank at that place that's owned by Kevin Smith. All right? Or something like that. Um, he owns a comic book yes. store, but there's also a collectibles thing in Red mm-hmm. Bank, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. I don't know if and it's the still name there. Of it. I believe it is, actually. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. Red so, Bank, close to Mount Pleasant, where you can buy shampoo that's 80 years old. There you <laughs> go. Years old. Point Pleasant, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Point Pleasant, um, second in time capsule. Yeah. So they're in the white. Uh, the vehicle is owned and being driven by his former teammate and longtime friend, Al A.C. Callings. According to Callings, Simpson was armed in the back of the vehicle with a pistol, I think a 22. He was holding it to his head and threatening to shoot himself if he wasn't taken back to his Brentwood estate. And he did all this because he was innocent, apparently. This caused the responding California Highway Patrol officers to pursue with extreme caution. They didn't want to be the guys that made O.J. Simpson blow his fucking brains out. TV stations interrupted coverage of the 1994 NBA Finals to broadcast the incident live. Okay? With an estimated audience of 95 million people, the event was described as the most famous ride on American shores since Paul Revere. Okay? And I have the picture. Why do I bring it up in today's episode? That's the most important thing about this story. What I'm going to tell you now is just kind of kitschy. Because as is so often the case with car chases, the skies above California were filled that day with news helicopters trying to capture footage of OJ as he ran from the law, uh, which they did with Kobe too. I mean, there were so many helicopters above his burning helicopter, Mm -hmm. right? Just trying to get some pictures of the carnage, right? They didn't know it then, But the chase was the first chapter in what would become the trial of the century. That's what they called it, where the jury uh, rendered a verdict of not guilty, (laughs) which is fucking crazy for the two murders. An estimated 100 million people nationwide turned in to watch the verdict announcement. So these are big numbers. And so the people who were above there were trying. So the airspace above the chase, two news helicopters and their pilots were jockeying for position in midair that day. One of them was named Dirk Vall, and the other was named Bob Tur. okay? These are two guys that are trying to get the best angle of this low-speed chase. They were enemies, and had competed for footage before in similar news events. Vall and Tur were the eyes in the sky for right... You worked at a fucking radio station, right? Let's go mm-hmm. to the eye in the sky. What are you seeing? <laughs> oh, but... And it's like... The George Washington Bridge, you know what I mean? Even we got traffic stuff. backed up on the George Washington Bridge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So these guys are trying to kind of get in there. They were the eyes in the sky for rival news stations the day to Los Angeles. Uh, the worst single episode of urban unrest up until that time. This is the Los Angeles riots. I don't know if the more recent riots uh, had trumped it, but the Los Angeles riots in April of 92, after the four uh, police officers were acquitted for beating up Rodney King, when those riots ended, 63 people had been t- killed, another 2,400 had been injured, and property damage was over $1 billion. It was fucking huge. So these guys were up there trying to catch that, and mm-hmm. now these seasoned pilots are again up in the air competing for footage when O.J. was on the run for a crime allegedly that he didn't commit, depending on who you ask. So after this whole O.J. debacle, those two fell out after disagreeing over who saw the chase first, right? Who covered it better? But then 20 years later, they found friendship. These two pilots, Twisted History of Pilots, after finding some new common ground, and that new common ground was a vagina. Not one, but both of them had transitioned to female. And Bob Tour, the award-winning CBS pilot, is now known as Zoe Tour, while Dick v- Dirk Val, once an NBC pilot, is now Dana Val. And the two of them were best friends. That's fucking wild. That's why they were so angry. They just were, they weren't living they their just, lives. They didn't want to. Yeah, they weren't in their own skin. They were just I, itchy. I was wondering who these two chicks were that are in this photo. I was <laughs> yes. like, where, where are we getting? Not the most handsome of women. Like sometimes I throw some cheesecake in there, but that's Dick and uh, Zoe or whatever. Uh, Dana and Zoe. One of them looks like they're an incredible cook. I'll, I'll just say that. <laughs> yeah. She looks like Something an incredible cook. Something about the OJ case, right? Yeah. TMZ ran the headline when this had come to light twenty years later. OJ Simpson. Helocopter pilots become Shilocopter pilots because TMZ is subtle as a brick. I was hoping that I could go on it's and tell you guys. That's a helicopter pilot. Yeah, that's yeah. A, that's <laughs> what a headline. What, yeah. a, what a comedic headline. Like what a. What a yeah. I was hoping to God that I could find something where these two were lesbian lovers. Now, I just thought you really that that were. Would be you, were cool. you were really hoping. You were. You were. Two former gentlemen who you. were helicopter pilots above OJ Simpson's chase are now two strikingly beautiful female lesbian lovers. It would have been fucking too good, but unfortunately the ladies are just friends. For now. You never know when they might decide to do a little scissoring. And um, the, uh, the place was called Famabilia. Famabilia, yes yeah, it's it was. Not, it's no longer there, but... Oh, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Um, okay. Rest in peace, Raymond Billia, the Bob Barker of memorabilia stores. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of quick pilot facts. Number one rule for fighter pilots. Always, always have the sun at their oh, back. I was going to say always keep them loaded. Always keep them loaded. I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah, like We're not it. guessing yeah, yeah. all right. No. <laughs> yeah. I love when I throw out the random fucking quizzes. Uh, always keep the uh, sun at your back. Because uh, as I'm reading about fighter pilots, and I think we're going to do part two, it's going to be mostly military stuff. Because mm-hmm. there's too many to go through. I have one military uh, story, but um, which is a fucking cool one, by the way. Uh, but otherwise, I didn't do any military pilots. So don't come at me with Red Baron and all that shit. I'll do it on when, uh, For military pilots, I just wanted to say this. My grandpa, who was in, the, in the Navy, uh, he always looked up to, to pilots. Said they're the most badass people ever. Really? Just so much respect for, for uh, Navy pilots. So. Really? And then they become like NASA astronauts. Yeah, of course. So I was always like, hmm. So yeah. that, that, that weighed on me, and that, that meant, That's that meant something. Cool. Yeah, yeah, so I, I always keep that in mind, that Navy pilots are just I've badass people. I've training currently. One of my roommates was a ROTC kid, so like, really? I, I, he's I, going through it now, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, and, and when they say how much um, back in the day, so I guess we'll go up to World War II, but certainly in World War One, which, by the way, World War One was like 1914, I think, if somebody wants to check that. 1903 was fucking Kitty Hawk. Mm. They're fighting with planes... With guns, they got the, eleven the, years. The, the Tampa St. Peter, Petersburg gliders, <laughs> yeah. literally, they're they're just made out of like right? plywood. Yeah, I don't even think so, they had engines for a, a, a while. A lot of there was yeah, there, and there was no radar, like so you couldn't see a MIG on your tail. So a lot of it was by eyesight. Mm-hmm. So fighter pilots say always have the sun at your back because you never want to just look into the sun. Obviously, makes so sense. It, yeah, it makes one hundred percent sense. Uh, I, mean, I know I'm going backwards a little bit, but I like this fact, and it it goes into another fact I'm going to do. Orville and Wilbur, the Wright brothers, never flew together except for one time. Their dad said, you guys are fucking crazy, and you're going to kill yourself. The only thing I ask is that you don't kill yourself together. It would be too bad on your mom. So they said, fine. They never flew together except for one time. Their dad allowed them to fly uh, May 25th, 1910, so seven years after they did, allowed the brothers to share a six-minute flight near Dayton with Orville piloting and Wilbur the passenger, and then afterwards... Orville took his 82-year-old father on his first and only flight. So that was the only time. And the reason I mention that is because, similarly, only three people in the nation were qualified not to fly, but to hand-pack the parachutes for the Apollo 15 mission in 1971. That's hot. This This mission is so fucking hot that only three people in the nation were fit to pack the parachutes for the spacecraft. And that expertise was so vital that they were not allowed to ride in the same car together for fear that a single auto accident could cripple the whole space program. That's pretty cool. Wow. You that know is what I mean? Cool. Yeah. Look at somebody else do something, but you can origami this, you know, nylon sheet so well, you know, you, you have that. It'd be so easy to fuck up. Just, I don't so feel like easy. doing this. <laughs> yeah. 100%. Nah, it's the Tuesday. Kingdom of Bhutan. <laughs> Bhutan? I think Bhutan, like, is always, uh, I think it's an, uh, an Italian word for, like, um, uh, p- pussy. Oh, you Bhutan. Uh, yeah, she's a Bhutan, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. But Bhutan, maybe, B-H-U-T-A-N. It's, it's like, sort of between, it's, like, near India. It's above India, I believe, Bhutan. Yeah, sounds right. Yeah, yeah, it's mountainous. I know, I know, I know Punta is, is, like, bitch in Spanish, or pussy. Punta? Yeah. Bitch. So, bitch? B-H-U-T-A-N, Bhutan. The Wright uh, brothers would know, because they weren't. Yeah. They didn't have uh neither of them married ever. Yeah, yeah. One of them was hmm. might have been gay. The they other one might have so been on, on the spectrum, spectrum. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. think Orville was, What's but going like on they were all the pilots. They were <laughs> so <laughs> up, like it, like their sister was the only woman in their life. Yeah. And then when she got married, Orville wouldn't even go to her wedding. He was inconsolable. Really? Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Until she like really she got really ill with pneumonia. Cuz their mom died when they were teenagers. Mm. Successful people are just weirdos. They're they're really to weird. Be. Yeah. You have so to I be. made yeah. up the story about his dad saying it would kill your mother. But the dad, I guess, then after losing his well, wife, no, they didn't want to young. lose his boys. I mean, yeah. I think, it, you know. Yeah. Is that, is, sorry. It's a true story that his dad wouldn't let him fly together, but yeah. I made up, it'll kill your mother. Is that what happened in <laughs> save, was it Saving Private Ryan, where they wouldn't let him on the same boat or something? Yeah, like, they wouldn't let so. the kids the Sullivan the same, Act, right? Yeah. 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 Um, but this Bhutan, I'm going to tell you about it. The Kingdom of Bhutan has only one international airport. It's 7,000 feet ele- elevation in a valley surrounded by 18,000-foot mountains. And only a select number of pilots are certified to land there due to it being the most challenging airport in the world. Fuck that. I will never go to Bhutan. 
another fact. Pilots are universally known as having the best view from the office in the world. That makes sense. I like, the, I like that. And then some people say astronauts have a similar claim, but technically their view is from outside of the world. <gasps> oh, I kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, most name brand airlines permit, uh, prohibit taking anything into the cockpit that could serve as a distraction. So no magazines, no books, no music. You can't even knit. They talk amongst themselves, and that's all they're legally allowed to do. I believe that's true with major airlines. Smaller ones, they're in there with fucking Game Boys. Um, the captain on the ship, uh, the captain on the plane, is actually allowed to arrest people. He can write fines, and he can even take the will of a dying passenger. That's cool. Good to know, yeah. Uh, pilots, if you have two pilots, pilot and co-pilot, you have to eat different meals to avoid you both being food poisoned. Um, 43% of British pilots admitted to falling asleep during f uh, flights. 33 of them reported waking up to find that their co-pilot had also fallen asleep. Well, British people are lazy. <laughs> yes, they <laughs> very much are. Uh, Colin McGregor, who is the brother of Star Wars actor, guy who plays Obi-Wan, Ewan McGregor. Mm -hmm. yep. Colin McGregor is a British Royal Air Force pilot, RAF pilot, and goes by the call sign OB-2. I like that. Hell yeah. Yeah, right? That's awesome. awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's one that hits home for me. Kidney stones are a common occupational hazard because pilots don't always hydrate properly. And post 9-11, FAA rules about entering the cabin can make trips to the bathrooms a chore, so it just adds up to stress on the urinary tract. Pilots get more. And that's... That's interesting. That's the worst pain, worse than having a I, baby. It, when I go see a movie at the theaters, I always monitor my drinking so I don't have to get up and go... Mm. Yes. To the bathroom. But you're very movie. hydrated. You do I know. I, and it, so it's, it stinks. It, it stinks. Oh, I'm terrible. Uh, kidney stones scare the hell out of me. They do for me, too. I should be I, I, I no, probably got to narrow your urethra. It's going to be real hard to pass yeah. through. Yeah. Learn from me, boys. Uh, who was the first president to fly in an airplane? And I can give you a hint. Um, I can give you a hint if you want it. No. I won't give you a hint. Woodrow right. Wilson. That was the bulliest experience I ever had. Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt Hell yeah. was the first to to president Panama? to fly. I don't know. But he told the pilot, that was the bulliest experience I ever had. I envy your professional conquest of space. Oh, oh man. <laughs> As a pilot, I would go home. If I was a pilot, I would break your fucking pelvis. If Teddy Roosevelt just told me I conquested <laughs> space or whatever like that, holy shit. Hell yeah. uh, Nepal Airlines, which isn't too far from Bhutan, mm -hmm. has the worst safety record in the world and has sacrificed goats in order to fix technical problems. I'll go into detail. In September 2007, the airline confirmed that it sacrificed two goats to appease the Hindu god following technical problems with one of its aircraft. Nepal Airlines said the animals were slaughtered in front of the plane, a Boeing 757. The offering was, was made to Akash Bhairab, the Hindu god of sky protection, whose symbol is seen on the company's aircraft. And I put it in here in the script. He's like a red-faced guy with three eyes and some fangs. If you ever see yeah. that, don't get on the fucking plane. Wh whatever's going to get this flight off the ground in time. I'm <laughs> yeah, down. Let's yeah, do it. Who gives a shit? Let's Just get me him. there. You guys have been around uh, the United States. We've all traveled pretty well, right? Mm -hmm. yep. There are giant concrete arrows built every 10 miles that span from New York City to San Francisco, which were used by Postal Service pilots in the 1920s that trace their way across America. These giant arrows are also called beacon stations and help guide the pilots of early airmail flights. Please, somebody look up beacon stations. Has anyone ever seen one? Never. They, you, you know, you probably have to see them from a plane. They're everywhere. They are everywhere, and they are essentially gigantic concrete arrows. And, the, and near these giant concrete arrows, they would be illuminated at night, because when they started the whole airmail thing, they were competing with like commercial aircraft during the day. So they had to start flying overnight or else it was cheaper to send your mail by train. So they essentially did these arrows between San Fran and New York and they're ginormous. And as you go and dive deeper, people are like, oh shit, I live near one. And they'll take a picture of it. Never knew what it was about. Have you seen one? No. I, you've never, but you see them right now on the internet. I, the, yeah, and yeah. I, unbelievably and I saw big. Almost like a a luxury apartment that looks like it's right by one. Too. Yeah. Like they're advertising almost like Beacon Station. I've never seen anyone who's ever seen one, and I'm 51 years old and well traveled. Kinda. No. You just flew out to LA last weekend. 
Did you? Well, you know, we, we couldn't see it from 30,000 feet. And oh, obviously okay. back then, like these were used in the 1920s. So that's that's the reason, right? Yeah. These were used in the 1920s and they were illuminated. And obviously the, the um, aircraft were flying at lower navigation and they didn't have all this stuff that we have now, um, you know, G- GPS and whatnot. So they needed this. And people were like, oh, couldn't you use just, you know, maps and a compass? Not necessarily at night. Yeah. It's not like you have to take a hard left at the third oak tree. Like it was just something that a familiarity that pilots were able to use. It's scary that they use them. I, I was going to say use the sun, but like you said, yeah. night, nighttime. Right, exactly. And even like clouds, like fuck you, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if it is during the day. So there's all this, uh, you know, intense navigational stuff that we can use now. But otherwise, look across the United States. There are literally thousands of giant concrete arrows pointing the way for the U.S. Postal Service. That blew my fucking mind because I never had seen it. Somewhat uh, kind of similar, but I always liked that at Six Flags, King Naka has the beacon at the top mm-hmm. for, for planes going by. There's what just a, What a fucking South Jersey trash thing I mean, to say. That's, Holy but shit, that's I gotta it. Be, no, I love it. That's got to be the coolest thing, though. Like in terms of looking at a ride, like holy shit, like this is so high up yeah. in the air that you have to pilots need to be yeah. able to see. No, it's it's, it's awesome. awesome. You ain't and, gonna go on King to Kyle, you little chicken <laughs> shit. <laughs> uh, the last fact I'm gonna get before I get back to co- pilots, I'm doing uh, basically for Eddie in Chicago. Huh. O'Hare Airport is named after an American fighter pilot, Lieutenant Commander Edward Henry O'Hare, who died on February 20th. Right, Carl. 1942 he became the navy's first fighter ace of the war so the first fighter ace of world war ii i didn't know exactly what an ace was i didn't know how many they had to winds up an ace is any pilot credited with shooting down five you have to shoot down five to be coming and i think that was brought up in uh top gun maverick like one of the guys wound up shooting down the fifth and at the end of it he's like you officially became an ace because he shot down like five things so this guy um we've all been o'hare right did you know who it's named after? No. No, no, no. No, I mean, do we kind of know Fiorello LaGuardia, uh, JFK is named after, I don't know. But, like, we don't know necessarily O'Hare. Did you know? You should fucking know this. Like, that's my whole point. Fuck Sully. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this up in a little bit. You should know about Lieutenant Commander Edward Henry O'Hare. There's an airport named after him. Eddie doesn't know. Well, he probably does. Eddie's a smart dude. This guy... The first fighter ace of World War II, he single-handedly attacked a formation of nine heavy bombers approaching his aircraft carrier. Even though he had a limited amount of ammunition, he was credited with shooting down five enemy bombers and became the first naval aviator recipient of the Medal of Honor in World War II. Okay? That's very fucking interesting. Plus, plus... Just two years before that, just two years, his father, who was Easy Eddie O'Hare. I love that. I I love Eddie from Chicago. How can I not like Easy Eddie O'Hare from Chicago? Easy Eddie owns a casino, many casinos, maybe. He was gunned down while driving a 1939 Lincoln Zephyr. And if you've ever seen the Lincoln Zephyr, that's the car, man. He was driving a Lincoln Zephyr coupe through the intersection of Ogden Avenue and Rockwell Street. Why not? I got a pizzeria owner. Why the fuck did they put that there? Right. So he goes through this intersection where two shotgun wielding mobsters gun him down because he was the only man willing to testify against Al Capone. That's the fucking guy who O'Hare is named after. That's his father. So the one guy's an ace and the other guy's a fucking mob informant. And we know who Fiorello LaGuardia is. It's a piece of shit. Ah, whatever. All right, so let's get back to some of the pilots themselves. First, we're going to go through some of the bad ones. And I love these fucking bad pilots. They're terrible. Two Russians. Like, this is like a hold my vodka type moment. So in October 1986, a Soviet pilot on a domestic passenger flight made a bet with his co-pilot that he could land the airplane blind. And so some of these old school um, uh, airplanes this was in 86 had actual blinds for the windows because if you had intense sunlight coming through you're on autopilot you didn't need to do anything not a lot that you were doing by sight in 1986 and whatnot they would actually close the shades or something to protect you from whatever so they were like close all the fucking shades i got this they did that and the guy's like i'll take the bet so the tupolev airliner was on a flight from sverdlovsk to kubishev when captain alexander kliuyev 
decided to try a blind landing as agreed on a dare with his co-pilot, Gennady Zhirnov. This is this, So this it's, happened. It's, it's just them on the plane, right? He, cl- he crashed the plane into the landing strip, killing 70 out of the 94 passengers. <laughs> oh killed 70 God. out of 94. Damn. Yeah. Kluyev was one of the survivors, the captain. He was sentenced to only 15 years in prison. He got out after six. Six wow. years, 70 people. His co-pilot, the Gennady Zhirnov, I dare you. He survived the crash, but died of heart failure immediately after while trying to rescue passengers from the wreckage. So, yeah, I want to re- repeat it because it's so fucking weird. Mm. 70 out of 94 on a dare. Oh, I can close the fucking curtains. <laughs> I got right? This. Yeah. That's a good Russian accent. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, so that, that's what I better. Fuck yeah. those people. <laughs> yeah. Um, then there was the cornfield bomber. Do you ever hear the cornfield bomber? No. Um, it was in Montana. So, in 1970, during a training exercise, I love this fucking guy. Vibs, I'm happy I'm telling you this story. <laughs> Are you okay with me telling you these stories? Yeah, You're absolutely. I, please, somebody remember just a couple of these fucking ones. It's a cornfield. I'm, I'm spitting all over the fucking place. So it's 1970. So we kind of know what the 1970s are, right? There's a training exercise, a U.S. Air Force Convair 106 Delta Dart. I put those names in. It means nothing to anybody. It's not a very big plane, okay? Made an unpiloted landing in a farmer's field in Montana, suffering from only minor damage after the pilot had ejected from the airport. From the airport? From the aircraft. I'm going to say that again because it's a big uh, sentence. So this F-106, which was an Air Force plane, so maybe a two-seater, made an unpiloted landing. There was no pilot in it because the guy had bailed beforehand. Okay? The plane went into an unexpected flat spin. So the, the, the plane started to go towards the earth and going into a spin. So the pilot's like, this shit's not going to work out. Boom. Hits fucking eject. He ejects. And when he ejects, the weight differential from not having him in the plane and the explosive force of the ejection righted the plane. So now this guy's in a fucking parachute and he watches his fucking jet correct itself and just start flying absolutely perfectly. He bailed way too fucking early. Mm-hmm. So now I gotta, right? I don't know. I, I just like this. So uh, the F O six, the F one o six recovered from the spin and landed safely in a field, and he can see it. The aircraft was found with the engines still running. Didn't even damage the fucking engines. The sheriff who was first on the scene saw the thrust from the still idling jet engine, allowing the the jet to just slowly move around the field. So he called up the Air Force base, and they said, just let it run out of gas. It took an hour and 45 minutes, and this thing was just slowly moving around the field. Absolutely nobody got hurt. One of the people in air traffic control had said to the pilot while he's in the fucking parachute, saying, man, I, wish you bet, you, I bet you wish you could jump back in. That's fucking terrible. So uh, a recovery crew from McClellan Air Force Base arrived on the scene and began to dismantle the aircraft, uh, aircraft to put it on a railroad car to bring it back to the Air Force Base. But the damage was so minimal that one of the officers is reported to have said that if there were any less damages, he could have just flown the aircraft out of the field. Meanwhile, the cowardly pilot, I call him a coward, but if I was spinning, I'd probably be out of there fucking first thing too. His name was uh, First Lieutenant Gary Faust, drifted comfortably in his chute into the nearby mountains, and he was later rescued by local residents using snowmobiles. And that Convair 106 Delta Dart was repaired quickly and returned to service, I think, within a week. That's fucking terrible, Jeez. right? But it's not like all it did was cause damages. So yeah. it's like a no harm, no foul type thing, except for the field in, uh, in the Cornfield Bomber in Montana. But a similar but more tragic incident had happened in 1989. And we didn't get a lot of info on it right away because of Russians, right? So this had happened when a pilotless Soviet MiG crashed into a house in Belgium, killing one person. And it's a very similar story. But that pilot, his name was Colonel Nikolai Skuridin. And he ejected over an hour earlier near Poland. So shit started to hit the fan. One of the engines died or something. So he was like, fuck it. And he hits the button. He ejects because of technical problems. But the aircraft continued flying for 600 fucking miles. He came way too early. This thing, 
he's in Poland. It went into East Germany, West Germany, then crossed over into Dutch, like, you know, airspace, and continued into Belgium before running out of fuel and then descending into some poor bastard's fucking house. <laughs> 600 miles away. You're oh like, my. bro, this thing was crashing. I was dead. I hit the fucking button. Where'd it go down? They were like, Belgium. He was like, what? I, I was in fucking Poland. They were like, no, we know. They were like, did anyone get hurt? Yeah, you killed the guy. I mean, that's uh, that's that's tough. That's a tough look. Um, did What happened? Did he go to jail? Did I think go, so, his, yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, you don't know with Russia, right? Like, yeah. he's probably killed on sight. Um, <laughs> and then John's favorite story, uh, Aero Flight uh, 593. This was one in 1994. A pilot's 13-year-old daughter and 15-year-old son were allowed to sit at the plane's cockpit while uh, it was on autopilot. And then the son inexplicably disengaged the autopilot, causing the aircraft to roll into a steep bank and a near vertical dive, triggered a series of events which led to the plane crashing into a mountain at around 200 miles per hour and the death of all 63 passengers and 12 crew on board. 75 dead. <laughs> That's a big fucking Jeez. number. And here's the thing. Despite the struggles of both pilots to save the aircraft, it was later concluded that if they just let go of the steering wheel, they just let go of the yoke, the autopilot would have automatically taken action to prevent stalling. Just put back on the autopilot, and it would have been right as rain. But they didn't do that. So they didn't evolve the accident, and they went in. And that's what people say. Or, and hear me out on this, keep your fucking kids out of the cockpit, right? Yeah. Especially that 16-year-old, 15-year-old punk, Right. The events. With all those buttons, it's cool to look at. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kids love the cockpit. <laughs> yeah. The events of 593 were featured in the Kid in the Cockpit episode of season three of the Canadian TV series Mayday. That's pretty gauche. Yeah, a little right? on the nose, too, <laughs> yeah. with the title. Yeah. Kid in the Cockpit. Kid in the Cockpit. Kid. 75 dead. 75 fucking dead. And it was the Kid in the Cockpit episode of, uh, of the Canadian TV series Mayday. Um, it seems like a good time to take a left turn to talk about autopilot. But first, uh, Jimmy Graziano is back. JP Graziano's. Go to tasterealchicago.com. Go there right now and go and look at all the stuff that Jimmy sells. This place is an old school Italian deli in Chicago. If you're ever in Chicago, go there for one of the greatest sandwiches that you've ever had. But if you're not in Chicago and you want a taste of Chicago, go to tasterealchicago.com. OK, there you're going to get the beef kits that Jimmy does. You can get the Gardnera, Jardinera, as they pronounce it, that Jimmy does. You can get the Muffaletta. You can get the seasoning that I wind up putting on everything. Like, you know, how people are like, oh, I'm going to shake in a little bit of dried basil, a little bit of oregano, a little bit of garlic. You don't got to do that anymore. If you have anything that wants to be kicked up a notch. Thanks, Emerald. You use this. Bam. I'm telling you right now, J.P. Graziano's is the only place, one of the only places where I actually eat stuff that gets mailed in. Right. Like we do um, that other meal service thing, which sends you like the raw materials. And I don't mind screwing with that. They haven't paid to be on. So I'm not doing it right now. Um, but J Jimmy Graziano's pre-made stuff is absolutely fantastic. I was speaking to him because I talked to him. I told you the people here, they were like, instead of add a copy, just speak to Jimmy. He said, give people a pro tip. If some people who think the beef kit is too hot, the beef kit is you essentially brown a roast. You put it in your um, slow cooker with uh, a whole jar of the Jardinera the seasoning and some uh, some stock. But he says, if they think the beef kit is too hot, too spicy, drain the oil before adding the Jardinera. I can attest to that. I fry my eggs in the oil from the Jardinera. I love this shit. Honestly, I love this stuff. Um, and if you don't buy the beef kit and you decide to do it on your own, if you buy like the, the, the lesser heat one, go on this thing and try this shit out. That's what I'm telling you right now. It's tasterealchicago.com. And there's a code, Twisted. The code is Twisted. That's the promo code, and it gets you 20% off, limit one per customer. So, tasterealchicago.com, JP Graziano, Jardinera, seasoning, beef kits, whatever you want. If you're in Chicago, go to the store. Twisted. Twisted is 20% off, limit one per customer. If you do go get a sandwich from them, maybe yell Twisted at them at checkout and see if they give you any money off the sandwich. That'd be kind of nice to hear. 
I would love for him to call me and complain. But really scream it. Yeah, yeah, yeah really scream it. Mean Twisted almost. history. <laughs> yeah, do something like that. I th I've told this story before. I'm going to tell it again. The autopilot was invented by a guy named Lawrence Sperry in 1914. It's not the most interesting thing about Lawrence Sperry, not by a mile. Um, it has undoubtedly saved hundreds of lives across the years, allowing pilots to get rest or to deal with problems on board without having to worry about maintaining level flight. Again, Wright flew a paper airplane in 1903, an autopilot was invented in 1914. Okay, so we went from a balsa wood thing to not being able to even touch the wheel. In those 11 years, not only do we have a fully functioning aircraft that can't be destroyed by a strong fucking wind at some North Carolina sand dune that this asshole here used to run down, right? We also have American pilot Lawrence Sperry inventing something that eliminates the need for the hand flying on long journeys. I don't know why I did that either. Thereby reducing pilot fatigue. Sperry's autopilot ultimately made flying much safer, but it had another less obvious benefit. It freed up pilots to do other things with their hands and their dicks. We, we, we spoke about this before. Perry was a handsome son of a bitch. So you fast forward just two years to 1916, and this guy, the same guy who invented the autopilot, switches it on while he's piloting a pretty big, a Curtis flying boat, a C-2, and he's flying it 500 feet above uh, uh, the coast of Long Island. So he's pretty low. Mm -hmm. We've been up more than 500 feet in hot air balloons, right? So he's got a C-2, a flying boat, and he's flying at 500 feet above Long Island. He flips on autopilot, right? Then he strips down naked, and he starts banging this chick named Cynthia Polk. Cynthia Polk. Her husband, at that time, while she was taking it, right? While she's getting horse pounded by Perry. Her husband was driving an ambulance in war-tour France at the time because we're in the middle of World War I, okay? During their lovemaking session, right? Very unselfish lovemaking. Sperry moves Polk to the side, and one of her gigantic tits knocks off the autopilot button. I made that up. But somehow along the line, the autopilot gets disengaged while they're having sex. I'd like to think that she just has no. I was, She was I like, was, oh, she was like disengage it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. yeah, yeah. Type it in. You want to see me go? Disengage yeah. this thing. She said, yeah. Look at these knobs. She threw over her back. Yeah, whatever. She's Googling <laughs> Cynthia Polk. I wanted to yep. look at those big I, old yeah, looking, too. Think, I yeah, wanted I to see. Juicy. Yeah, she's probably fine. Just Not whatever. Just. Let's think about it, though, for a little while. Cynthia. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, so the autopilot switches off, right? And it sends the plane <laughs> crashing into the Great South Bay, <laughs> Billy Joel's place, right? And then <laughs> fucking, they're rescued, but they're rescued uh, by duck hunters. And when they're rescued, they're stark naked, but they insist that their nudity was a result of the force of the crash knocking their clothes off. But there was a visible load in Cynthia's hair that told a different story. And I made that up, too. It wasn't a load. But they were naked. And everyone gives them credit uh, for starting the Mile High Club. Hell yeah. So if you ask who started Mile High Club, there was somebody who fucked somebody in a balloon in, like, you know, France at one point. But otherwise, I think Lawrence Sperry is one of the guys who's credited for it. And then the New York tabloid Mirror and Evening Graphic went on to report the story on its front page with the famous headline, Aerial Petting ends in wedding that's not bad either it's a little gross wedding right yeah 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah put her up on a joist everyone's moist i don't know what you would have said in that right taking in the ass watch out for the crash uh, whatever but it, so that's what happened and that's back to pilots we're going to good pilots and my notes here said sully gets a lot of credit fuck sully and i agree with that i think sully did a good thing by landing in the i'm not even gonna tell you what sully did because everyone seems to know about it already yep. right you sound what, so angry about Sully. Wasn't that big of a fucking deal. It wasn't. Yeah. Sully just has a better agent than other people <laughs> who had done better things than, than Sully. Than the miracle on the Hudson? Come on. All right. How about this? I will tell you the next story. If I will, Every story that I tell you, I only have a couple left. You tell me if it's better or worse than Sully. You're tell, and tell me if it would make a better or worse movie than the movie Sully. Okay. Fair enough? Love it. That's fair Love enough, right? Yeah. You have to uh, say yes to it, too. You're part of this fucking team. <laughs> okay, yes. Right. Say it. A FedEx pilot <laughs> once inverted a cargo jet, pinning a hijacker to the ceiling of the plane. Yeah, so this a FedEx awesome. guy. This is a great story. Yeah. A hijacker comes up, turns the fucking plane upside down, mm -hmm. has the guy pit, okay? And it's wild. It's 1994. Federal Express Flight 705. It's a cargo jet 
carrying electronics from Memphis to San Jose. He was involved in a hijack attempt by a FedEx employee named Auburn Calloway, who the prosecution argued was trying to commit suicide. And he was. We'll find out why. Calloway boarded the flight as a deadhead passenger. The reason I know what that is is because that's what Tom Hanks was in Castaway. So if you're like a passenger who works for the company, you fly for free on a cargo plane. Oh. A deadhead passenger. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. I thought it was just going to be a person who just showed up with what they had. Like, they had oh, no, yeah. no, I thought no they belongings. were going to a dead concert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like just, yeah, just reeks of weed. Yeah. 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 But a deadhead. So, yeah, we have a deadhead. All he was carrying was a guitar case with him. Inside that guitar mm-hmm. case, this is already better than fucking Sully, right? Inside the guitar case were several hammers and a spear gun. Oh, love that. Come on, it, Sully and shit. Anyone carrying secret things in a guitar case, Claw money, hammers, weapons. Perhaps ball peen. I, I don't know. While boarding, as he came onto the thing, he switched off the aircraft's cockpit voice recorder, essentially switching off the black box. Seems, seems like that feature shouldn't exist, but... Yeah, <laughs> yeah that shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a kill switch on that. But once... Um, once it was airborne, he planned to kill the crew with hammers so their injury would appear consistent with an accident rather than a hijacking. The recorder, though, was switched back on by the flight engineer who believed... He's like, oh, shit, somebody turned that off. So he flipped mm-hmm. it on. So that thing is already blown out. There is a full vo- uh, voice recorder or whatever it is, okay? I have no clue what he planned to do with the fucking spear gun, so investigators assumed it was intended as a last resort. Once he hammered the crew to death, that was the plan. Once he hammered uh. the crew to death, Callaway planned to crash the aircraft, hoping that he would appear to be an employee, deadhead employee, killed in an accident, and his family could collect on a $2.5 million life insurance policy provided by Federal Express, which they never mentioned in um, Castaway. You think Helen Hunt got $2.5 million? And she then married, married the other. And then was no, banging that guy. Yeah. She, she wasn't married to him. They were only engaged. Oh yeah. That's why she, I Good yeah. point. That's why she yeah. gets that. Damn. Thing. I would have hated her if she got two and a half million. Then I didn't hang around. Absolutely. Don't get me started on that because I didn't like the fact that she had a kid that already with this new guy. He was gone five years. She's already married and has a kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, she, you don't just fall in love with somebody. She had it one. Takes f- a couple of months to fall in love, then to plan a wedding. Then be married for a while. Then have a kid. So she she had a foot out the door. Quickly. She had a foot out the door when Tom Hanks got on that plane. So. You get screwed by Jenny too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jenny. Jenny's, 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 Jenny's dad was always loving Hanks, and touching yeah. her. Yeah. Tom Hanks was involved with a lot of whores. Jenny and uh, Helen Hunt. <laughs> Drives a cunt. Uh, so anyway, so his efforts to kill the crew were unsuccessful, partially because he fucked with the wrong crew. Before I go into it. This guy, Galloway, or whatever the hell his name is, Calloway, Calloway. excuse me. Auburn Calloway. He was um, he was a jiu-jitsu guy. Like, he didn't know how to, to handle himself, you know? So, it, like, going at somebody with hammers and, you know, being, like, slight of build or something probably wouldn't work. This guy could handle himself. Mm-hmm. But the crew was 49-year-old Captain Dave Sanders, who worked for FedEx for 20 years and previously served with the U.S. Navy for nine during the Vietnam War. Yeah, Dave. And then there was 42-year-old First Officer Jim Tucker, who had worked for FedEx for 10 years and previously served with the U.S. Navy for 12 years during Nam. Yeah, so he's got two Vietnam vets behind the wheel. And then there was a 39-year-old flight engineer, Andy Peterson, who had worked with FedEx for five years. And here's the timeline. I'm going to do two timeline stories, even though we're almost at the end. 26 minutes after takeoff, Callaway went to the back to get his weapons. He entered the flight deck and attacked Peterson, uh, Tucker, and the first guy, who's for Dave Sanders. Okay? All three received multiple hammer blows. Both Peterson and Tucker suffered fractured skulls, and Peterson's temporal artery was severed. The blow to Tucker's head drilled shards of bone into his brain and initially rendered him unable to remove, to move or react, but he was still conscious. Is it conscience or conscious? Conscious. Okay? So two guys, fractured fucking skulls. When Callaway ceased his hammer attack, Peterson and Sanders began to get out of their seats to go after Callaway as he left the cockpit towards the back to retrieve the spear gun. So I said Peterson and Sanders. That means that the chief engineer, Peterson, the 39-year-old, and the captain, 
49-year-old Sanders went to go get the guy after both being clobbered, leaving the co-pilot, Jimmy Tucker, who was also in the Navy, as the guy who's in the cockpit flying this flight. Okay? When Callaway came back into the cockpit with a spear gun, Peterson grabbed the gun by the spear while Tucker then put the DC-10 into a sudden 15-degree climb, throwing Sanders, Peterson, and Callaway out of the cockpit and into the galley. That's genius right there. So he's coming up into the cockpit. This guy banks high. Everyone gets thrown out. Mm -hmm. He did this all to throw Callaway off balance. Tucker then turned the plane into a left roll, almost on its side. Think about that. It's a big, you know what I mean? This rolled the combatants onto the left side of the galley. Tucker then rolled the plane almost upside down at 140 degrees, pinning Peterson, Sanders, and Callaway to the ceiling of the plane. But somehow this Callaway guy managed to wrench his hammer hand free and hit Sanders in the head again. So he's still beating on these two guys that are back there. Then Tucker, again, the only guy who's in the, um, in the, uh, the cab, puts the plane into a steep dive at a speed of 530 miles per hour testing the aircraft safety limits, and throwing the men to the back of the plane. So now everyone's shoved to the back of the plane. This is better than Sully. Easily. This is easily better than Sully, right? I mean, this guy is hammer attacking with a fucking spear gun, and there's broken skulls, and they're fighting to the death while some guy is jumbling a gigantic fucking plane. He's moving it like it's the thing that crashed into the cornfield. What were you saying? I was going to say, all Sully did was his job. Oh, yes, wow, you, la you landed the plane? Yeah, you're supposed to do that every time you take off. Take off land. It's your, it's your job. Right. This D guy's fighting hammer attacks. The DC-10 levels off at 5,000 feet. Peterson was bleeding out from his ruptured temporal artery and going into shock. That's the guy who's driving the plane. But Sanders managed... No, no, that's not the guy who's driving the plane. That's the other dude. Tucker. Tucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sanders managed to grab the hammer out of Callaway's hand and attacked him with it and eventually succeeded in restraining and disarming Callaway. So it seems like that threat is now nullified. So then Sanders, the captor, the captain, goes back to the cockpit and takes back control from Tucker, who by this time, because he'd gotten hit in the head too, mm -hmm. right, had his sense of touch severely diminished and was paralyzed on the right side of his body. So, he, so he's flying the fucking plane one-handed. Just limped over flying. Yeah. Ugh. So fully laden with fuel and cargo, this big-ass ship has to now land at the closest runway. Sanders gets people up on the radio. They find a runway. Then he tells them about the weight and the fuel within the plane. And they said, you can't land here. And he said, fuck you. This is better than Sully, man. And when he hit this small little runway, which he had no business of staying on, he hit it and he started zigzagging in order to slow down. And he wound up using that runway. And they weren't going to let him to do that. That's, that's fucking crazy. Emergency personnel and police gained access to the plane and found the interior of the galley and cockpit covered in blood. Callaway was arrested while Peterson, Tucker, and Sanders were taken to a nearby hospital. The crew of Flight 70, 705 all survived the attack but were seriously injured. The left side of Tucker's skull was severely fractured, causing motor problems in his right arm and right leg. Callaway had also dislocated Tucker's jaw, attempted to gouge out one of his eyes, and stabbed his right arm. Other than that, how was the flight? <laughs> Captain Sanders suffered several deep gashes in his head, and doctors had to sew his right ear back in place. Mm. Flight engineer Peterson's skull was fractured, and as I mentioned before, his temporal artery was severed. The aircraft itself incurred $800,000 worth of damages. All three of the men that I had mentioned, I tried to keep them straight. I apologize if it got a little jumbled. They were all awarded the Gold Medal Award for Heroism which is the highest award a civilian pilot can receive. But due to the extent and severity of their injuries, none of the crew had been recertified as medically fit to fly commercially. Damn. Callaway, this asshole, pleaded temporary insanity, but was still sentenced to two consecutive life sentences for attempted murder and attempted air piracy. He's now known as Federal Bureau of Prisons Inmate 14601 at USP Allenwood in Pennsylvania. You want to know what the best part of it all is? The attempted hijacking of Flight 705 was featured in the Fight for Your Life episode 
of season three of the Canadian TV series <laughs> Mayday. Is that fucking crazy? <laughs> Mayday, yeah. Mayday seems awesome. Yeah. yeah. Right? It took a dark turn for yeah, season yeah. two or whatever. <laughs> yeah. John Kelly's seen all these. <laughs> oh, man. John Kelly masturbated to all yeah. these. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think. That won't make it. So I think the thing with Sully was that, number one, it was, the, it was 2014, for and Sully. it was the first time that New Yorkers had seen a flight that low. I mean, I still hit the ground. Don't so I'm just fucking, saying, I think don't people do were, the 9-11 card on No, this. no, no. I'm saying it was the he, first time people, like New Yorkers, had seen a, a plane hovering over the Hudson. He had less than a minute to make his decision. He saved 155 lives. And he did, you know, he made that decision less than a minute. That's, yeah. that's What's pretty... a better story, better movie? Oh no, I, okay. I'm not. I'm, I'm not taking you. anything with it. I'm What's, just saying, was was Sully, Sully a better movie than the Fight for Your Life no, season I think three they episode definitely... of a Canadian TV series? I think they should remake Mayday, it with us. 2005. I think crush it. I'll play you Auburn. I'm in July saying. of 1983, Air Canada Flight 143, most commonly known as the Gimli Glider. This yes. is number two. 69 people on board. Nice. Can I, right? can I just say we had our first outing, and now I think we're having our first fight as a, <laughs> yeah, as a, exactly. as a podcast. 69 people are on board. They run out of fuel at 41,000 feet. 41,000 feet. Level 410. I would freak. Somehow, 223,000 pounds of jet fuel had been put in instead of 22,000 kilograms. Kilograms were more than pounds. Before. Classic mistake. And there was also this like, dip, nah. uh, listen, read this about the Gimli glider. They were using dipsticks because there was something wrong with uh, their gas gauge. So the dudes who there were so many people who were at, at fault on the fact that this thing ever got off so, the fucking ground. So they're just eyeballing the fuel. And they're basically eyeballing it. Yeah. So but Jeez. think about it. This is. So anyway, they go up forty one thousand feet and then they just run out of fucking gas and they have no fucking idea. But the pilot is this guy, Captain Bob Pearson, and he managed to glide the plane down safely 41,000 fucking feet, Jeez. Sully. 41,000 feet. Yeah. He sl- without any fuel. He glides the fucking thing down there. I mean, luckily he was an experienced glider pilot because being a pilot and being a glider pilot are two different things. One of them is you need gas to be one. All right? So... 69 people on board, 41,000 feet in the air, no problem. He puts it down in like a go-kart racetrack known as Gimli Motorsports Park. Both of his engines were dead, so the plane made hardly any noise during the approach. So these people in fucking Gimli, I don't even know where it is. I don't know what Gimli Motorsports Park is. But with both of the engines dead, the plane made hardly any noise during its approach. This gave people on the ground no warning of the impromptu landing. So it's like it's like when a Tesla come picks you up for fucking Uber. You don't hear its engine running. Except this is a an Canada Air Flight 143. Yeah, I was gonna say Gimli's in good old Manitoba. Oh, Manitoba. Yeah. <laughs> What's some freak people out? So the gliding plane closed in on the track, and the pilot, this goddamn stud. Uh, where Captain Bob Pearson, he said two boys were riding bicycles within a thousand feet of the projected point of impact. He said the boys were so close that he could see the look of terror on their faces as they realized that a large aircraft was bearing down on them. He didn't hit them. He landed. All 69 people <laughs> made it. <laughs> yeah, what's up, kids? What's up, boys? Don't do drugs. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? And um, so a great story. And the best part is... The TV series Mayday covered the incident 2008 <laughs> yes. episode called the Gimli Glider. Mayday was fucking money. Yeah, and I've never seen it. Um, I got. I think I got one more. I got one more before I close up. If if that if you guys are still with it, that that by Can the I, way better than Sully Gimli I, Glider. I I think Sully might have one up on the Gimli Glider. I agree with that. Okay. The first one is legit. Those okay. guys I, were. Those no. guys were. So studs. I'm gonna give you one more. I like the glider. I'm going to give you two more, right? Two, one of them you guys have heard before. So I'm going to give you one more new one. And then you tell me that Sully doesn't get two out of three, right? That I'm right. Okay. okay. This is the last one that we'll judge. In 1940, two Royal Australian Air Force training airplanes collided in midair. And again, these are not big seaters. They're uh, military airplanes, okay? They're not uh, domestic air, air flights or whatever. They collided in midair and became locked together. They were traveling in the same direction, so they became an impromptu biplane, and they were landed safely by the pilot of the upper plane. There were no deaths. So they're pilots and engineers in either plane. They're both going the same way. They hit one on top of the other. They lock into each other, and then this guy was able to pilot it with the top plane and made it. So 
Both navigators and the pilot of the lower plane somehow bailed out from inside. One of the propellers had cut him into the side because it went into the cockpit of the lower plane. So him and his engineer wound up bailing out, while the upper pilot, leading aircraft man Leonard Graham Fuller, found that he was able to control the interlocked aircraft with the ailerons and flaps and made an emergency landing in a nearby field. Fuller was promoted to sergeant after his successful landing, but he was also confined to the barracks for 14 days and docked seven days pay for speaking about the incident to newspapers without authorization. So he got in trouble for it. And here's the unfortunate ending. I don't know if it was on May Day. Honestly, I'm not sending that. But four years later, four years later, in 1944, this guy, Leonard Graham Fuller, who banged into another aircraft and then piloted both of them down safely into a field, did a belly land in one of these things. He got hit by a bus while he was riding a bicycle fucking dead. Ugh. That sucks. That's better than Sully. No? Yes. He flew two fucking airplanes. Yeah, uh, you got to give it to this one. I mean, Sully, 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 Sully doesn't even have a post building. credit scene. Like, this, <laughs> this has got it all. Yes. Okay. That's legit. They're all, they are all studs. A, Without a, a doubt, 100%, they are all a studs. A goose took Sully down. Yeah. <laughs> a goose. Thank you, Vibs. This guy had a whole airplane hit him. Thank you, Vibs. All right, one last story, then we're going to get the, uh, out of here. You guys may have heard this, but it's from the Twisted History of Luck that me and Vibs had uh, hosted. It's one of my favorite stories in the world. It's of Pilot story. Tim Lancaster. Okay, Pilot Tim Lancaster. And it's actually not even the story of Pilot Tim Lancaster. It's more his uh, co-pilot, which we're going to get to. But both of these guys are much more interesting than Sully. I guess this is the Twisted History of Fuck Sully. So this is British Airways Flight 5390. It was in 1990. If you jinxed Sully, by the way, that's not good. Oh, I think Bob, I think Bob, I think Bob is, Barker yeah. is more on the <laughs> list. Yeah. I'll never if forget If I take myself. out another, you know, nonagenarian, right? Right? Because she was 90-some-odd, right? You, you, you jinxed her just I pulled nonagenarian out of my ass, by the way, too. <laughs> um, June 10th, 1990, 8.20 a.m. Flight 5390 departs from Birmingham, England, from Malaga, Spain. At the controls, Captain Tim Lancaster. He's 42. He's got 11,000 flight hours logged. The co-pilot is a guy named First Officer Alistair Atchison. He's 39. He has 7,500 log, uh, flight hours logged. The aircraft itself is 18 years old. There's 87 people on board, 81 passengers and six uh, crew including three male flight attendants. Progressive. Very progressive. And and I think it's lucky here. I think it's unbelievably lucky that they had male flight attendants. Jack, you have no historical reference with Twisted History, so you haven't heard this story, I'm assuming. I don't, I don't think so. Do you remember this at all? Uh, not really. Are you okay. saying, yeah, because male flight attendants are able to keep a level head, unlike no, no. <laughs> female ones. Yeah, well, hysteria <laughs> comes from the word. Yeah, so um, hysteria and hysterectomy. Um, so... But I'm going to tell you why it's better that they had three male flight attendants. Okay. Right? The expected cruising altitude was flight level 230. I just said flight level 410 when they were at 41,000 feet. A commercial aircraft, depending on its size, typically climbs to altitudes at 18,000 feet all the way up to 60,000. So flight level 230 is 23,000 feet. Did you know that? I remember this now. I think I was actually on for this one. Oh, were you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because... Um, like that balloon, the Chinese balloon mm -hmm. was yep. like 60,000 feet. Right? I saw it, yeah, I saw it was also like 200 feet tall. It was big. Yeah, it was the size of two like uh, trucks or something like yeah. that. Yeah, uh, buses. Um, so I'll say that again. The expected cruising altitude for this flight was flight level 230. So as the plane climbs and reaches flight level 174, so 17,400 feet in the air, on the way to 23,000, the left cockpit windshield blows out. The fucking window just blows out. Mm -hmm. And that ejects Captain Lancaster from the plane. Okay? The aircraft begins to nosedive with the captain hanging out of the window by his feet. It wasn't his seatbelt that saved him. His feet got caught in the fucking yoke. So now, if the plane's coming down, this pops open. His body is straight along the fucking hood of mm -hmm. the plane. You know, flailing around like one of those things you see in front of used car things. Right? And his feet are caught in there. <laughs> so his torso was outside of the plane while his legs were trapped inside. And he was being flung around by 345 mile per hour winds, losing consciousness because the cold, thin air is at minus 17 degrees. Sully. 
The cockpit door <laughs> is then ripped out from the rapid decompression, and a male flight attendant, whose last name was Ogden, rushes into the flight deck and latches his hand onto Lancaster's belt. This is where I'm saying, like, you think you get more power, yeah. right? With yeah. very few. Bigger dude. Yeah, yeah. First Officer Atchison, who's a fucking stud here, tries to contact air traffic controllers to inform them of the emergency, but the wind noise in the cockpit is so strong. Again, they're going almost 400 miles per hour. I mean, you know when you open up one window in the car when you do an 80, and everyone's like, oh, fucking close it. You know, <laughs> you know like all that stuff. Yeah. You know, like, imagine you're doing this. And you're trying to, hey, it's emergency. Can you repeat? I can't yeah. fucking repeat. Captain's up the <laughs> Open fucking Open the other window. side. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just crack the other side and do it, right? Um, so ground control cannot interpret the transmission. The aircraft rapidly descends towards London, which, by the way, is the busiest airspace, you know, certainly one of the busiest in the world, if not definitely the busiest in Europe. I don't know. But it's busy. Mm. And without aid from the ATC... Yeah, traffic control. First Officer Atchison risks entering active airspace with other aircraft. So that's where this guy becomes a stud because he's like, fuck it. I'm going like imagine landing a JFK blind and just saying I'm coming in. Nobody fuck with like it's there's a there's a plane coming in there every five minutes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've seen the, the, the skies above it or anyone who lives near an airport. They know another male flight attendant, John Heward, enters the flight deck to assist. Heward sits in the cockpit jump seat and he holds on close to flight attendant Ogden. So now it's starting a little bit of a human chain. Might have blew him. They both managed to remove Captain Lancaster's feet from his yoke. So now it's these two gentlemen, these two heroes, mm. who are holding the fucking captain in while Atchison is trying to bring it into London. So now... <laughs> So now Atchison continues to descend to an altitude where the oxygen is thick enough to breathe and it's starting to get warmer. The other flight attendants try to reassure the passengers to prevent panic mm -hmm. as the aircraft descends to 11,000 feet, right? So it's somewhere around 17 down to 11. Captain Lancaster's body, right, because it starts to flatten out, moves position towards the side of the fuselage. Another flight attendant, Simon Rogers, also enters the flight deck to aid the others. Flight attendant Ogden still latched onto Lancaster, beginning to suffer from frostbite, bruising, and exhaustion, is relieved by the help of the other flight attendants. When they, After, sorry, when, they, when they went over like the, the loudspeaker, do you think they said what the exact problem was? Or they're just like, we're think. having a little oh, bit ladies of Ladies and problem. gentlemen, uh, yeah, this is your captain speaking. Uh, <laughs> Imagine just that little bit in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can't Slight get the graphics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can I get you, a drink? <laughs> yeah. Anyone walk around the cabin if you could kindly take your seats. Um, I was floored by the story. When we did when we originally did luck, yeah. and I was I remember when I was giving you all the details of this. I know for A, I don't remember you telling me. It's a good story though, no? Sully. By the way, but I'm just saying, like every t like every five minutes, I'd be like, and then his eyelids in this, and you'd be like, yeah, all yeah. right, we gotta eat dinner. Yeah, uh, ladies and oh, gentlemen. Oh yeah, yeah. When you found this, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, our I captain is like flailing go. on the hood. <laughs> I take my work home uh, with me. Uh, <laughs> so now, captain. So the one flight attendant is exhausted, right? I don't mean to feminize him at all, but the other two come in. They're relieving him. They get the captain. So now the captain's body goes from the top. Of the plane, he was holding him for a long time. Fuck yeah, yeah he's I mean, frostbite. Like, oh, so now the yeah, captain slides down and he's flailing against the the side of the window. And if anybody knows, if you've been seasick and you're hanging there and you're hitting your chest on the side of the yeah. table as you're rocking. Yeah. No, Afterwards, flight attendant Rogers sits in the jump seat. Flight attendant he Heward sits in the left seat. They can see Captain Lancaster's head through the plane's left direct vision window. Because his eyes are open but do not appear to be blinking, the flight attendants assume he is dead. Yeah. And the flight attendants discuss, should we just let go of him? Mm. Like, will that help? But First Officer Atchison, who's the real hero here, orders them to keep holding on as the captain's body could strike the wing or the engine and make situations worse. We all know that Sully was brought down by a bird. This guy could be brought down by a real body. Flock of birds. The aircraft enters Heathrow. They're, together, they're very strong. <laughs> yes. As one, they're weak. Yeah. <laughs> the aircraft enters Heathrow airspace, which, again, one of the busiest airports in the world. And Atchison finally slows down enough to be able to hear radio transmissions. ATC acknowledges the emergency and orders Atchison to change course 
and instead landed nearby Southampton Airport. So he goes down, he's, and now he has to go back up. So he begins his diversion to Southampton. As the aircraft makes preparations to land, Atchison informs controllers on the ground that Captain Lancaster is dead. Important to note here, throughout all this, barely any fuel has been burned because it was so early in the flight, and no fuel has been dumped either, which means that the heavy fuel-laden plane might overrun Southampton's smaller runway. Like, we're not out of the weeds mm -hmm. yet. British Airways Flight 5390 is now on its final approach to Southampton. With too much weight, too much fuel, and three male stewardesses holding on to the captain who's hanging out of the fucking front window. And finally, only 35 minutes after taking off, British Airways Flight 5390 stops on runway 2 at Southampton at 8.55 a.m. 35 minutes of hell. Everyone on board survives including Captain Lancaster, who is immediately revived and only suffers from frostbite, extensive bruising, and shock. I don't even think he broke a fucking bone. And they almost let him go. Imagine that. Jeez. Right. They almost fucking let him go. First <laughs> Officer Atchison, who is the guy who said, don't let him go, he suffered from a dislocated shoulder, frostbitten face, and left eye, but everyone else left the aircraft unhurt. And this is how it all went to pot. This is what happened. Accident investigators found that a replacement windshield had been installed 27 hours prior to the flight's takeoff, but the mechanic who replaced it had used retention bolts that were too small in diameter. So the air pressure difference between the cabin and the outside was too much, causing the windshield to simply pop off. It was just the fucking wrong screw. Camp Captain Lancaster began working again less than five months after the accident until he left British Airways in 2005. The aircraft had its windshield correctly replaced and continued service until being scrapped three years later in October 1993. Uh, that's it. You got, I mean, back, yeah. you got back to flying. That's he went right back into the fucking wow, cockpit geez. seat. So that's that's part one, right? That's part one of Twisted. I mean, we, we do, right? We have a lot more to cover, I think, oh, as yeah. far as that goes. Mm -hmm. Like, do you have a story? I do. I, we could save it for part two. Or you want to save it for part two? Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, I think we, we put it, all right? Yeah. It's, so uh, save it's slightly military-based, too. So if we're going with Perfect. military, yeah. Because, I mean, I'm going to do the George Bush thing. Okay, like yeah. the, is George Bush Senior, eight, eight, like yeah, uh, yeah, fuck, no. he has something on his summer home, some some Kenny Bunk slang, set slang, saying like right. clear skies, Cava or something, okay, clear skies, I don't know, it's an yeah. aviation term, anyways. No, so one. I think yeah. I think what? him, I think like all the other stuff would be a definite, and I think that this shit's interesting, right? I mean, this yeah. is a pretty good episode. Yeah. Um. All right. So I twisted history of uh, uh pilot. See you guys next time. 